this is just the beginning. Hi, and welcome to Hard Truths. I'm Sarah K. Helani Gu. I'm the executive editor at Axios, and welcome to our virtual event today. I'm joining you today from our Axios headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, almost empty here, as many of us are working from home. Um, I want to thank first at the top our sponsor, Lyft, for making these conversations we're about to have possible. And I want to welcome our online audience who are streaming from many different locations today on Axios.com, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. It's really great to have you for this really important segment we have today. Um, you can follow along and be part of the conversation too. As a reminder, use the hashtag Axios events and tag us at Axios on Twitter. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be unpacking a big topic about voting restrictions and disenfranchisement that factors into the 2020 elections, as well as our nation's history that and our historic barriers that have prevented people uh, based on race from voting. This is just one part of our larger series called Hard Truths, where we'll be unpacking a different topic each month over the next 12 months, and we hope you follow along. For our first guest, I'm really excited today to add a little bit of Hollywood glamour to our event. Uh, we have here two stars of the Golden Globe award-winning television series, The West Wing. Richard Schiff and Janelle Maloney are joining us with Richard from Vancouver and Janelle from New York City. Welcome to you both. Hi, Thank you. how are you? It's so great to have oh. you guys. One reason we wanted to talk to you, of course, is because you both are active in the Get Out the Vote um, initiative this year. And we're, of course, we're two weeks away from the uh, big election day. Um, you both also were part of a big uh, new uh, reunited episode, I guess, of the West Wing. I just saw your episode on HBO Max uh, over the weekend. It was really great to see all of you guys back in your old characters, just like it was yesterday. Um, and I wanted to have you talk a little bit about this episode. What was the purpose for you getting the team back together to do this particular episode and this particular Get Out the Vote message? Uh, Richard, uh, I'll ask you first. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I think this particular episode, um, I remember from years ago when we, we decided to get the uh, get together and do something for this election cycle. And Aaron uh, mentioned that we were going to do Hartsfield's Landing. And I went, okay, I remember the title, but I don't remember what it's about. And then he said, it's you and Bartlett playing chess for one. And I went, oh, okay, I remember that. Then I read the uh, uh, show again because I had never seen it. And I was kind of blown away by how poignant and relevant and resonant it is today, even more so. Uh, it brought me, uh, it, I had an emotional response to it, which I did not have years ago. Years ago, it was a beautiful ode to voting, an ode to our democracy. Uh, and today it's, it's, it's a call uh, to action to save our democracy and to relish um, uh, the process of voting and don't take it for granted. Um, it's it's a rare thing this in this day and age around the world uh, to have the privilege to vote and the right to vote. And we should um, be very careful to not let it be extinguished. And this, this episode addresses that. Mm -hmm. And Janelle, um, I wanted you to weigh in here too. This episode, for th folks who haven't seen it, I'll just catch them up real quick. It, it has a lot of the similar drama you see in any West Wing episode, I think, where there's an international crisis, um, there's a lot of strategy conversation, but it also happens on the eve of Election Day. And in particular, there's a lot of eyes on a little town in New Hampshire that is going to vote. And Janelle, your character plays a big role in that. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, I think that in Hartsfield Landing, the town in New Hampshire, there's, uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, in the, the story, there's 42 people that we are all kind of obsessed with because these 42 people, um, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine, whoever, whichever way they vote, uh, the election goes. 
So, um, so they won. It was very important to them to have the um, the vote go our way. And there was a little bit of an there was an attempt by Josh to get Donna to get out there and try to influence this one couple that were were kind of turning on us to vote for us. And um, and there were several different. Uh, pieces of it where I go back and try to get them to vote. And then um, in the end, um, if you watch it, I don't want to spoil it, but it's it's really what it's all about, which is that uh, people have the right to vote and make up their own decisions, but but it's just so good to people vote. It's, it, it's 20 years old. I don't think there's a threat of spoiling too much. That's true. <laughs> good point, Richard. Right. Yeah. Uh, I got to say, first, I have to say, if you don't mind, that uh, that I um, I didn't watch the show very often, and um, and and uh, I, I watched a little bit lately because of West Wing Weekly podcasts, and then watching this, I just saw this last night because I'm in Canada and Canada doesn't get it, so I got a special link from the producers to watch it, and I was just thrilled to, to watch Janelle work um, on this episode, um, and uh, uh, she's so good, she's so good. You fall fell right back into into. Uh, into Donna so easily, and quit, and the facility you have with uh, with Josh and and the storyline, uh, the connection you had. To, I just thought it was great, by the way. And and Martin too. Martin, phenomenal how uh, how he uh, how he did in that episode, uh, which I just saw last night. Finally, I had to say that. Sorry, Jim. No, no, don't say sorry. You're giving me really wonderful compliments coming from you, Richard. That that really. It is like that makes me feel really good. It's not. It's been a long time since I've had this kind of material to um, to play with, and the kind, the level of actors that I get to work with, and you know, and and not to like just make this about Richard and Janelle complimenting each other, but Richard exemplified something that I thought was really so fascinating, kind of wonderful creatively in this episode, which is, you know, everybody like people went back into it and found something new also. And um, there was a particular moment with Richard where I thought, oh, my God, that's new. He didn't do that the, the, the last time. And that's so different and authentic. And so, it, you know, it was a very exciting group to work with then. And, um, and it was very healing, actually, um, for me personally to be with everybody at this moment when, um, when the world is so, feels so broken right now. It was really personally like such a gift to be able to be with all of these people who give me a lot of strength and courage and creatively just to get to do it. It was really, really fun. You both have been active in politics for years, I know, but this effort, this episode and the organization you're partnering with, with um, is actually a nonpartisan organization with a message to get out the vote. How did you guys get the idea to come back together for this particular cause? Uh, Richard? Yeah. Uh, well, we, uh, yeah, thank you. We all we all had uh, an idea to, to to get together and do something as we have done in the past for PSAs for campaigns in different election cycles. Um, a few of us had the idea to come together. Aaron uh, was had the idea to do uh, a reading of sorts for the Actors Fund as a response to COVID, and um, then realized that there were kind of more pressing issues. Um, having to do with our, uh, an existential threat to our democracy. And we all came together with this idea to promote voting. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so we did. Um, we did. And it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's considered a nonpartisan uh, effort. And I would say that it's partisan in that we are supporting those that believe in democracy and that believe in the right to vote. And, uh, and that's a di differentiating us from those that don't want um, everyone to vote. So it's partisan in that respect. Well, hopefully we all can get behind that democratic ideal. Um, I want to ask you about the West Wing as a show. It's, uh, you know, journalists and others like to say the truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, with journalists, it's been uh, quite a ride uh, to cover a lot of uh, um, history in the making. I wanted to ask you that I, I remember watching The West Wing when I first moved to D.C. I feel like it was a show that kind of made D.C. cool. And it's had a bit of a resurgence uh, as people are discovering it for the first time on Netflix. And I think it's going to HBO Max. Uh, Janelle, I wanted to know from you, why do you think that is? 
Well, first of all, I, I think it's just excellent. You know, it's just, it's so incredibly good. And, and it really hasn't, I mean, once in a while you see somebody with like a, a, a Blackberry or a big binder they're carrying around. So it dated from, uh, dated in a little bit of, 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 of those ways, but um, in general, just the, 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 the writing is just so beautiful. And, um, and that's why I think this thing that we did was so easy to do it as a, as a play because Aaron's a playwright. So the writing and, and um, so I think mainly it's that, but uh, every year in our world for different reasons, I feel like since the beginning of West Wing to now, people have been drawn to it as a source of comfort and a kind of alternate reality. And, um, and they did right in the beginning because everyone was feeling so cynical because of Clinton and, and Lewinsky and that whole thing. And then Bush, of course, and the, the, and Afghanistan and Iraq and the whole thing. And now it's, you know, it's so obvious. I mean, I think people just need to dive into something and, you know, it's never gone away really. It's not like it's a new resurgence, but it's very, very, um, important to people right now. Well, thank you so much to both of you for your time. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on this new ep on this new revival of the episode. It's been great to watch you um, and the rest of the cast members uh, come together. Um, I just want to thank you again, uh, Richard Schiff and Janelle Maloney, for joining us um, this afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye. My pleasure. Thank you. And up next. Joining us will be our White House and politics editor, Margaret Taleb. Hello, my name is Margaret Taleb and I'm the White House and politics editor for Axios. Our next guest is the chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, Ben Hovlin, joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Ben. Hi, Margaret. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We are, after all, two weeks out from the end of this election. Um, and you know, many Americans have concerns about whether their mail-in ballots are going to be counted, whether it's safe to vote in person uh, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, whether when they get to the polls, they're going to encounter intimidation or suppression at the polls. What is the Election Assistance Commission doing to assure that between all of these concerns, people can actually vote safely and effectively? Thanks. Uh, obviously, it's a very busy time of year. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing uh, in the lead up to this is working with election officials all around the country uh, as they've helped to uh, adapt their processes and procedures to run uh, an election during this pandemic uh, with unprecedented challenges. Uh, but one of the biggest things for people to know is that the professionals that run our elections have been doing an amazing job responding and that in every state there are options on how to vote. And it's important for voters to be aware of those uh, and pick the, pick the option that works best for them. Uh, if you wanna vote by mail, uh, if that's how you feel most comfortable, uh, deadlines are important. Uh, certainly uh, we're about two weeks from the election. And so it's important if you, if you haven't requested a mail ballot, that may not be the best way, or you're gonna wanna do that immediately. Uh, if you've got it in hand, uh, I would say go ahead and send it back as soon as you can, as soon as you're ready. Uh, you know, but also a number of states have early in-person options, also another way, great way to vote. One of the big things this year is helping to spread out voting over all of the options so we can help limit congestion and make it as safe as possible for voters and poll workers. Um, before we go any further, I feel like maybe we should explain to people what the Election Assistance um, Commission does. Um, it was created after the 2000 election crisis, uh, and you were um, named by President Trump, but actually recommended by Senator Schumer, I think. So help people understand, like, is this a partisan group? What is your function? Do you work for President Trump? Uh, so thanks for that question. The, the Election Assistance Commission is, is a small commission. Not uh, We aren't necessarily the most known federal agency, but you're right. We were created after the 2000 election as part of the Help America Vote Act of 2002, which was Congress's response to the, uh, to the 2000 election. And we are, uh, I mentioned a small agency, but we're independent uh, and we are bipartisan. So we have four commissioners 
I'm one of them. Uh, but we have, uh, you can't have two more than two from the same party. Uh, and so we are, uh, as I said, bipartisan and independent. Uh, and we do a number of things related to elections. Uh, we help distribute federal grant money from Congress. Uh, in the last two years, we've distributed over $1.2 billion uh, to help make our elections more secure. And then uh, 400 million of that was with the CARES Act this spring uh, to help state and local election officials respond to the pandemic. Uh, we also test and certify voting machines. Uh, and then finally, one of our big responsibilities is serving as a federal clearinghouse uh, for how, uh, for the best practices in election administration. Uh, anytime you look at how elections are run in the U.S., uh, you have to look at the fact that uh, we're very decentralized here and the 50 states each run elections in their own unique way. And at the AAC, we help keep track of that. Uh, we operate the only national survey of its kind, uh, the EVE survey or Election Administration and Voting Survey, that gives us real data about how Americans participate in the process. Um, what uh, What are you learning so far? Um, uh, how confident are you that we can avoid another crisis like what happened in 2000? And it seems like if there are problems, like in that case, it was Florida. There's 50 states and you know a dozen swing states. I mean. What happens if there's a multi-state challenge? Is the country prepared for that? Uh, you know, I think what we're learning is people are very enthusiastic. Uh, certainly, we saw through the primaries uh, an increase, a significant increase in mail-in absentee ballots. Again, we know from that EVE survey that about 25% of Americans vote by mail uh, in a normal year or in 2016. So we're going to see an increase probably closer to half. Uh, but that's all it really is, is an increase in uh, a trusted voting method that we've been using for years. Uh, but then also we're seeing a surge in early in-person voting. Between those, uh, we're already uh, around 30 million Americans that have already voted for the, in the 2020 election, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, with about two weeks to go, uh, you know, we saw there were about 140 million people that voted for president in 2016. Uh, so again, uh, you're seeing voters very enthusiastic. We're likely to see records in a number of places, but you also see voters spreading it out through those options that I talked about earlier, uh, whether that's mail ballots, early in person, uh, and some people are certainly uh, waiting until election day. But the biggest thing uh, really is to find that way that you're comfortable voting and make sure that your vote is cast uh, and the professionals that run our elections will make sure that those are counted accurately. You are, uh, if I heard you right, you're estimating around half of all Americans are going to end up voting by mail this year. I mean, that's extraordinary. And it seems to me that um, it makes it all the more important that people can trust that their ballots are actually going to be counted, that there's not going to be any shenanigans, that they're not going to get lost in the mail, that um, they're not going to have voted in time, but then it doesn't get there in time. Um, are you concerned that there could be a real crisis here? Or or do you are you feeling relatively confident about um the process and people's ability to trust that their ballots are going to be counted. Yeah, you know, voting by mail is very safe. It's actually how I personally voted. Uh, you know, I put mine in the blue in the blue mailbox at the end of the block, and I checked my state election website, and there it was that it had been received. Uh, that said, there are more pieces of the process involved with mail voting. There are the timelines that you mentioned. Uh, making sure you sign the absentee ballot envelope following the directions. Uh, and so, again, I think it's a safe way for people to vote. It's a great way for people to vote in a pandemic. Uh, but it's important that people uh, don't miss deadlines, make sure they follow the instructions. Those are the biggest reasons that mail ballots aren't counted. Uh, and certainly people can help alleviate that by, by putting it back in the mail as soon as they can uh, and following those instructions. And that'll go a long way to making sure uh, that their vote is counted. And again, uh, you know, I would just encourage people to do it as soon as possible. States fall into two categories. They tend to be received by election day or they have a postmark standard. Uh, I'd say take that out of the picture and just send your ballot back as soon as you can. I want to ask you one more question. We're almost out of time. Uh, we've done some polling on this and I found the results very disturbing. Uh, there's a real difference in uh, how uh, white voters and voters of color in this country uh, view their safety at the polls, their ability not to become disenfranchised 
the role of the police, whether you're going to encounter, you know, militia, armed militiamen. Uh, what are you doing to ensure that people of color can vote safely in the polls without intimidation this year? Yeah, you know, that's an important question. And I think it it ties into, again, that people need to vote how they feel most comfortable. And so there are those options. Uh, you know, we haven't seen anything like that in early voting. Uh, you know, certainly I've heard a lot of this talk, but I also know that we've seen uh, a significant amount of efforts to divide us, both, uh, you know, the normal partisan efforts that you see, but but also uh, uh, foreign adversaries interfering in our election. And, and what I can say is that I know that the professionals that run our election, uh, the public servants are doing a great job. There's a lot of options on how to vote. And the most important thing for Americans to focus on right now is how they can engage, how they feel comfortable engaging, and just make sure that they vote as soon as they can uh, and however they're most comfortable doing it. Chairman Hovland, thank you very much for joining Axios. Thank you for having me. And thanks to our sponsor, Lyft, for making this segment possible. Up next, we have a view from the top with our vice president, Kristen Burkhalter. Thank you, Margaret. And now I'm happy to be joined by Heather Foster, who is the Senior Director of Policy Engagement and Strategic Partnerships at Lyft. Hi, Heather, welcome to Axios. Hi, Kristen, thanks for having me today. Really excited to connect with you today. Interesting times for sure. We were just connecting before we went live here and two weeks until the election, 25 million, according to Axios reporting, have actually voted as of this weekend. It appears that Americans are paying attention, but the big question is, are we doing enough? So let's dive in and talk about some of the things that you and Lyft are doing right now. I've been following the announcements about your voter access program, and it appears to me, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that this is just one important initiative within your larger Lyft Up program. For our audience, can you tell us about the voter access program and how it works? Absolutely. So yes, our lift up programs are really created to, to bring transportation to people um, that may not have access to it. And so we think about our lift up programs in a lot of different ways. Um, as you can imagine with COVID-19, we partnered with a lot of organizations to provide rides in areas that greatly needed transportation. Um, there have been a lot of natural disasters this year. So that's another way that we provide transportation by working with groups on the ground, um, particularly after some of the hurricanes and then of course the California fires. Um, we have provided grocery access this year. And then another lift up that program that we talk about a lot is around jobs access. And that allows us to partner with organizations and provide rides to people when they may need a ride for a job interview or in those first critical weeks of getting a job, making sure that they have transportation. So that is the goal of our lift up programs. And we have been expanding them. But also when we thought about voting this year, we knew that transportation is critical. You know, we saw where a lot of polling locations were consolidating. We knew that people were starting to make plans. I think you've heard that over and over again in a lot of the messaging that has come out around voting this year. And so we are providing a code. Um, and so for anyone who wants a ride to a polling location or to a drop box, because we know so many people are doing vote by mail this year, they can use the code 2020 vote. And for any ride up to $10, they can receive a 50% discount. And so we're asking everyone to share that code 2020 vote. And we're working with a host of partners across the country to give out these discounts. That's amazing. Uh, really impressive what you guys are doing. Let's go a little deeper on that. From your perspective, why is transportation such a barrier to voting? You touched on it briefly, but I'd like to hear from you a bit more, and what will your voting access programs be able to do to make an impact? Well, we took a look at a lot of the statistics that came out of 2016, and it was estimated at the time that more than 15 million eligible voters did not go to the polls because they lacked a way to get there. And as I mentioned before, given a lot of the um, changes that we've seen with COVID-19, 
we knew, okay, transportation may be a barrier in a lot of different communities. And so we thought to ourselves, you know, how do we expand this program? And we started talking about this as early as the primary calendar earlier this year. So with a lot of the elections that are a part of the primary cycle, we started working with organizations to distribute ride codes. Because in our minds, we really did not want transportation to be a barrier to anyone. So I think that is how we thought through our voting access program. And it's a main reason why we thought to ourselves, okay, let's work with a lot of organizations who are doing this work on the ground. And so we have been working with over 20 nonprofit organizations to distribute free and discounted rides. Um, and we really know that what we've heard, we've gotten a lot of feedback from these organizations as well, is that people were looking at transportation when it came to not just how will I vote this year, but when it comes to voter registration, or if I need to pick up some forms, you know, those are all ways where people are gonna rely on transportation in a way that they may not have before because they were used to using public transportation um, or their schedule has just changed as so many people have found that they're working different times of the day now given COVID-19. And you touched on this briefly, the importance of the strategic partnerships was what made this a success, your voter access program. Can you tell us about a few of these key strategic partners and why they matter? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we worked with over 20 nonprofit organizations and we saw that a lot of them were also thinking about creative ways to share information about voting this year. So it, as I mentioned before, not just the make a plan idea, but also, you know, has my polling location changed? You know, is the information different? How are the hours? And so we thought that we would partner with a lot of these organizations who were sharing information. Organizations like When We All Vote, vote.org, who are giving people tools to make sure they know how to participate in the election process this year. And so when it came to things like registering to vote or you know making sure that if you do want to volunteer on voting day, we wanted to make sure that people had transportation and rides. And as I mentioned, we even expanded our program this year to make sure that we included our bikes and scooters. And so once again, people are able to access discounts or receive free rides through those um, modes of transportation as well outside of our ride share. And so some of the partnerships that we've done, you know, we've worked with organizations like More Than a Boat, uh, which is giving ride access to all of the arenas who are uh, uh, turning themselves into polling locations this year. And we've seen key population centers kind of like Atlanta, Charlotte, Detroit, Houston, and other cities are working with More Than a Boat. And we are providing free and discounted rides for those locations as well. Another creative program that I kind of would like to talk about as well is what we're doing with the Social Change Fund, which is an organization created by Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, and Dwayne Wade to promote issues in the black community. They have partnered with HBCU Heroes, which is a nonprofit that supports historically black colleges and universities. And they are working with over 25 schools to provide rides on election day. So, you know, those are some of the creative partnerships that we put together, but we're also working with organizations like the National Federation of the Blind, Student Veterans of America, NAACP, and the National Urban League. Well, I had no idea. Uh, fascinating partners, and that makes sense why you're having so much success. Um, in August, I had a chance to catch up with your chief policy officer, Anthony Fox, and we dove into all of the efforts around racial justice that Lyft is focusing on. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're thinking about beyond the election? So at Lyft, you know, we had a company-wide conversation about racial equity. And we found that we are doing a lot in communities. We are partnering with organizations locally. Um, so for example, we worked with the Lake Street Council in Minneapolis. We have worked with other larger organizations like the NAACP and the National Urban League to come together and really think about, okay, transportation has been a barrier too long historically in a lot of communities of color. And so one, we created an access alliance over the summer. Um, and that alliance comes together quarterly 
they give us best practices. They tell us specifically what some of the needs are in specific um, communities. And we therefore think about the ways that we're gonna deploy free and discounted rides in those communities to make an impact. We're also engaging many of them around our jobs access program, as I mentioned, and we'll be expanding that as well in different ways. And so that is one way that we have really thought about our racial equity work. We've also looked internally at Lyft um, and we've started new programs. We've revamped our diverse supplier and diversity program internally. And so, so those are some of the ways that we're continuing to strengthen how we think about racial equity and particularly how we think about transportation and how we can knock it down as a barrier, particularly in communities of color. Heather, thank you so much for your time today and for your smart insights. Thank you to you and thank you to Lyft for being a part of this important event. Heather Foster, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kristen. It's my pleasure. And now back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Kristen. And I'm so excited to introduce you to our next guest. His name is Desmond Mead. He's a voting rights activist in Florida who's worked on behalf of uh, restoring voting rights um, to Floridians for many, many years. Um, he is the president of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Thank you, Desmond, so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. And I have a, uh, an additional important uh, title as well. As the first time author of uh, Let My People Vote. This is a book that actually chronologized my journey uh, from being homeless all the way to uh, passing Amendment 4. Congratulations. Yes, I was going to mention that, but you beat me to it. Um, this book just came out this month, right? A month before the election. And Desmond, I know that you have been working hard uh, in Florida for many years. Many people may know your name, uh, uh, but I want to give you a moment to just introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your story. It's so inspiring and um, incredible. And I uh, wanted to start with your history, your own experience with the criminal justice experience, uh, yeah. with the criminal justice system that got you into uh, voting rights activism. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. And, and, and I'm, you know, I just want to just touch on a couple of high points. The rest of them, of course, you can read about it. But, you know, my drug addiction caused me to make some real stupid mistakes. Um, and it because of that, I was in and out of jails and eventually I landed in prison uh, with a 15 year sentence. Uh, fortunately, I was able to overcome that and have my sentence reversed and, and reduced and eventually released in uh, the winter of 2004. But like I tell folks, yeah, I might have been released from prison, but uh, I was still entrapped in the throes of drug addiction, and which led me once again to being homeless again and, and actually standing in front of railroad tracks waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. That was in August of 2005. But that train didn't come that day, Sarah, and I ended up crossing the tracks and checking myself into drug treatment. And after completing drug treatment, I moved back into a homeless shelter. While there, I decided to go to school. And I did extremely well to eventually uh, graduate with a couple of um, associate's degree, as well as a bachelor's degree. Uh, and I was eventually accepted into law school. And in May of 2014, I graduated with a law degree from FIU, College of Law. But because I live in the state of Florida, and at the time, uh, they had this Jim Crow law about felony disenfranchisement, I couldn't even practice law because my civil rights have not been restored. As a matter of fact, even today, even though we have successfully passed Amendment 4, I am still barred from sitting uh, for the bar exam, for the Florida bar exam and I still cannot practice law. And there are many places where I am not even allowed to own or even rent a home until my civil rights have been restored. Oh my goodness, that's so it's so amazing. I mean, many people, it, it's, it's an inspiring story of how you pursued your education despite all the odds, yet you face barriers at, at so many uh, levels and you still do. Um, I just wanna tell our audience a little bit more about your accomplishments. Um, you mentioned Amendment 4. In 2018, your work, your organization's work, led to the successful passage of Amendment 4 in the state of Florida. 
And it was this initiative, uh, citizens and uh, grassroots initiative that restored voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions, which is so uh, incredible ach achievement. That that has been said as the um, largest, single largest expansion of voting rights in a half century in our country, um, which is just incredible. However, um, you know, Amendment 4's impact, full impact has not really taken place yet, right? So um, the reason is because Florida's governor and legislature then required uh, those Floridians who would be eligible to have to pay fees and restitution. I understand the average is like $1,000 per person in order to get their full rights restored. So there are still these barriers. So I know that you and other organizations are, you know, like you've got some famous people helping you now, like LeBron James, uh, John Legend are trying to help people pay for those fees. Could you let us know, like, what is the status of paying those fees, do you have a sense of how many wow. people will be able yes. to get the right to vote this election? Yes. Sarah, thank you so much for asking that. But, you know, you touched on a couple of things that I have to respond to. You know, while it was, I mean, I cannot underscore how impactful re-enfranchise re of 1.4 million people is. But what was even bigger than that was how we did it, Sarah, that we were able to move a major uh, a social issue Right, and we were able to do so by bringing together people from all walks of life and all political persuasions. That at the time when the country was so divided, that we were actually able to win something powerful through love, right? Not through hate or fear, but rather through love. And we showed the country, we showed the world that love can, in fact, win the day. And 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 in addition to that, we know that when we passed Amendment Four, that we tore down that Jim Crow a barrier that's been in place for over 150 years. And even though we have a governor and a legislature that's throwing these obstacles in our way, it does not remove the fact that American citizens no longer have to grovel at the feet of any, at any politician uh, uh, begging for the right to vote, that there is an alternative pathway. And we are 100% committed to making sure that every one of the 1.4 million returning citizens and more that's growing every day have an opportunity to experience the the, the, the the advantage of Amendment 4 passing. With that being said, you know, you, we've had patriots. You know, while the state of Florida have been forcing us or forcing people to choose between putting food on their table or voting or, or, or between paying a rent or mortgage or voting, we've had patriots across this country from the LeBrons and, the, and the Michael Jordans to everyday average American citizens from all walks of life. We've had businesses like Levi's and Viacom uh, that have poured into our fines and fees fund where we've raised over $25 million uh, and we spent that money uh, uh, clearing the pathway for over 40,000 returning citizens, 40,000 people who otherwise would not have had an opportunity to participate in what we know is the most critical election uh, this country has ever seen. And so we're mm -hmm. excited because we are a people, number one, who are not intimidated. Any entity or any individual or elected official that attempts to intimidate us or discourage us or to suppress our vote, we are going to respond with vigor Right, by bringing out even more people to vote, our family, our communities, you know, our loved ones, to actually show up and say that democracy would not be held hostage. You cannot intimidate us. You cannot discourage democracy because this is the land of the free, the home of the brave, and we're going to fight through all suppressive uh, efforts and make sure that people know that returning citizens play the critical role in deciding the direction that this country is in. Thank you so much, Desmond. And you know that Florida is not the only state with uh, barriers like this uh, for, uh, for for people who have a felony conviction, have paid, already served their time. Our nation is really a patchwork 
where some states allow, um, you know, uh, can, uh, people who serve their time to vote after they're done. Others have to pay fees. Others can vote while they're still in prison, which is pretty amazing, um, including uh, the District of Columbia, where I live. But what is next? What are, the, are you focused on other states beyond Florida? What is uh, the next step in your view? So let me tell you, uh, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition is a part of a much broader network of organizations that's led by returning citizens or formerly incarcerated people. And so these are, are, are organizations, the individuals that are doing amazing work. Uh, you have Norris Henderson in the state of Louisiana that's uh, doing amazing work in, in, in freeing the vote. You have Dara Atkinson in North Carolina that just won a major case uh, and have allowed people to, uh, more people to be uh, re-enfranchised a part of the process. And then you also have in California where we have uh, people like Susan Burton and Dorsey Nunn, uh, 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 Tatiana Taina Vargas, that's leading the effort to restore the franchise to people who are either on probation or parole, right? So this mm -hmm. thing is caught on like a wildfire and, and all across this country, people are really standing up because America is a nation of second chances and it's showing up right now in a major way and we believe right now that Florida is an outlier with all of these restrictions uh, and on obstacles that our, our governor wants to place in, in front of returning citizens. Even in the state of Iowa, where the Republican governor has, uh, has allowed uh, easier access to democracy with, without people having to pay fines and fees. And so uh, I believe that- Thank you that, so much, Desmond. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's so it's uh, I have a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot more of you uh, in the uh, elections to come and, and other things. Um, your story is so inspiring. Thanks again for joining us at Axios, and we'll have to leave it right there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. And uh, we're going to turn next to uh, our political reporter, Alexi McCammond. She's up with our next segment. Well, good afternoon and hello. My name is Alexi McCammond and I'm a political reporter with Axios. Our final guest for this event is the president of the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project, Lydia Camarillo, joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Lydia, it's good to see you. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Well, we know that there's a lot at stake in this election. And one of the biggest trends that we've been watching at Axios is the changing demographics in this country and what that could mean for the election. We know that the Latinx community is now poised to be the largest racial or ethnic minority group in the electorate for the first time in the 2020 cycle with I think something like 32 million eligible voters. I'm curious what that means to you, what that means for this election and how that changes the work that you do. Well, we're very excited uh, that every uh, year, 800,000 or more Latinos turn 18 that are U.S. citizens. And so it, in the span of four years, it could be 3.5 3 to 4 million new folks that we have to register to vote. Uh, and these are all young 18-year-olds who are U.S. citizens. And then there's a new, another group of folks that naturalize, not at the pace that we've, we've seen before in past uh, administrations, but nonetheless, those are folks that we need to also register to vote. So for us, it's very exciting. It's important to note that Latinos live in the competitive states, whether it's Iowa, uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, and of course, uh, Florida, and let's not forget Arizona and Texas. So I think that the Latino electorate can be the deciding factor in this election in, in partnership with other groups like the black community, the uh, the Muslim community, Asian American community, and progressives, they will decide this election. You know, some of the criticism that Democrats and Republicans have gotten in past election cycles, whether presidential or midterms, is that they kind of wait until the 11th hour at times to really engage with Latinx voters. I'm curious if you see that changing in this cycle, and do you see Democrats and Republicans engaging with these voters in different ways in 2020? Well, I think that the 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 one person, the one, the President Obama, when he won, I think he his campaign was very smart to know that they were he was not going to win with the white vote only, that he needed the, the entire black vote, which delivered uh, President Obama to to the White House. 
but they understood that the Latino community was a key component and they worked very hard. I've seen very few uh, campaigns focusing on turning out Latino voters. And in fact, they do wait to the 11th hour. Uh, in, in the Midwest or the North Carolina or Florida, uh, in Florida, they think that it's only the Cuban Americans where it's actually a very diverse community. It's there's Mexicanos, Venezolanos, Puerto Ricanos, Colombians, de todo. There's, there's, there's voters everywhere. But in the other uh, states, there are uh, Mexicanos and Puerto Ricans in the, in the north, uh, in the northeast and in the Midwest and in North Carolina. And they can make a big decision about uh, this election. In Arizona and in Texas, they could decide the election because they will be 25% of the, of the share of the vote. And while Texas is not considered competitive unless there's an investment, it could be the deciding factor if there's issues with Florida or one of the other states in the Midwest. Given the changing dynamics in this year alone, and you know, to your point, how the Latinx community could really change the dynamics of this election and the outcome of this election, have you noticed that uh, the Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project has received more support in this cycle and, and kind of leading up to the 2020 election than you've noticed in years past? I think because there are now so many groups doing the work, I think we're all getting our fair share of support. Uh, I think the question becomes, how do we all work together and how do we all uh, work in a time when COVID is not allowing us to work in the same way that we're used to? And then we've also got voter suppression issues. I think this uh, cycle, we, uh, uh, in order for uh, Latinos and Blacks and communities that are progressive uh, to make their point when they vote, they have to make sure that when they show up to the poll, they understand that they are in fact registered to vote so that they're not turned away. And then they also have to make sure that they are dil uh, diligent about making sure that they include other folks and that they make sure that their vote is counted. There is going to be uh, tactics that suppress the vote. Uh, there are already tactics that suppress the vote. But there's tactics that like, I'm sorry? How worried are you about those efforts to suppress the vote? I, I'm very worried, but I think that because we're two weeks out, the best way, we, the best thing that we can do is to turn it, turn the largest number of voters, so that if there is uh, a question about the the whether the, there was the election was rigged, as the, as the president likes to say, that if the election is won by a large amount, then there's no question. The question becomes uh, when the president will call an election that's rigged. Or in the past elections, when in Texas they argued that 100,000 citizens did not have the right to vote, or the president in 2016 argued that 3 million people voted that didn't have the right to vote, the more people that vote, that argument can be immediately diffused. And that's why we're arguing that the best way to win this time against any attempt to suppress our vote is to make sure that everyone that we know votes and that they vote early and that they take someone else that has never voted before. You know, one of the topics we're focusing on at Axios, of course, is systemic racism. And part of that is what that means for voters and your ability to vote in this country as a black or brown person. I'm curious what you identify as the greatest systemic barriers to voting for the Latinx community. Gosh, there's a few, but I think the, the greatest systemic barrier is there's an assumption that the Latino community is a sleeping giant, and it is not. Every four years, uh, two more million Latinos will be registered to vote and a million more votes will be cast. This is without hardly any investment. The Latino electorate is the second largest voting bloc now in American history. It is the youngest electorate, it's the fastest growing electorate, and it's the, it's the electorate that is ignored by every group or campaign. Uh, except at the 11th hour, they re realize, oh gosh, I need a few more votes here or there. So I ask you all to think about the future. The future is with the Latino community and the black community. You know, some Democrats I talk to say that the Latinx community, there's a bit of a risk with turnout because so many of the new voters are younger voters and younger voters across the board just typically don't turn out at the same rates. But as our last question for you, um, what's your message to people who say, well, we can't count on the Latinx community to show up and vote? Um, and how is your strategy changing in these last couple of weeks? Well, the Latino electorate, the medium age of a voter is 22 years old. So for us, we, we know that if you speak to a voter four times live, 
whether it's a phone call, a, a contact uh, that is at the door with COVID, that's likely impossible, but a phone call and other uh, messages through social media, emails, et cetera, they will turn out, I guarantee you that. History has demonstrated that through since we started and opened our doors. Well, Lydia, thank you so much for joining Axios today. We really appreciate your time. And thanks for talking about this important issue just two weeks away from the election. I can't believe we're this close. Thank you. And don't forget to vote. vote. Well, thank you all for joining this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to our sponsor, Lyft, for making this event possible. Again, I'm Alexia McCammond, a political reporter with Axios. As a reminder, this event is the first in our Hard Truths Initiative, a year-long series on systemic racism in the U.S. Our first Hard Truths deep dive on voting should have hit your inbox last weekend. Each month, our newsroom will go deeper on topics such as housing, education, healthcare, and others. And we hope that you'll jo join us along the ride because these issues aren't going away. For more info and to sign up for our Axios newsletters, go to signup.axios.com. Make sure to download our Axios app. And as always, we'll see you on the axios.com stream.